I'm uh, Blaise Agurarkas. I, I work at Google uh, and uh, lead a team in Google AI uh, that works on intersections of, um, of neural nets uh, and you know, the, the form of AI that is sort of particularly neuromorphic uh, and, um, uh, and, and devices. And, and the reason that we work on the intersection of devices and neural nets is because we feel like a lot of important um, uh, privacy and, uh, and ethics issues in, uh, in, in AI actually depend on, um, on those uh, technologies being sort of extensions of, of the human uh, as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to being uh, just parts of a service. Um, so uh, in, in that setting, uh, you know, we, we certainly work with a lot of, uh, of neural nets that do the classic sorts of machine learning tasks of, of, uh, of classifying stimuli, of going from media to meaning. And uh, you know the the most classic media to meaning kind of problem, of course, is MNIST. So this is uh, you know twenty six by twenty six pixel grayscale images of digits, and the network is supposed to uh, take take the image and uh, uh, and say that's a, a two. Um, and with the advent of of deep nets, we uh, we now of course have the ability to do much much more sophisticated sorts of things, like say that uh, you know a picture of two people hugging is hugging. Uh, or do uh, sentiment analysis uh, using sequence models, uh, or uh, or decode speech in a, in, a, uh, in a quite convincing way, you know, much better than than with previous approaches. Um, uh, again, using using combinations of uh, of sequence models and uh, fully connected models and, uh, and and other sorts of things. Um, what the um, what the classic techniques uh, all had in common was that they began with a, a feature. Uh, a feature reduction stage, a dimensionality reduction stage, in which uh, hand-coded um, sort of uh, um, detectors would uh, look for maybe uh, corners of, of an image or fiducial points on the face or, uh, or, or certain spectral components in, in the sound um, and, uh, and, and thereby reduce the dimensionality of, of, the, of the input media uh, to a space that's small enough that you can then apply things that essentially look like regression uh, or that look like like very uh, very simple uh, techniques to um, to do the training, and um, that that of course is a way of making the models a lot smaller and making a lot more use of uh, of the engineer's intuition about what matters uh, about the image, um, and uh, and it also allows you to use a lot less training data to train your model because uh, because now you just have to train a low dimensional thing rather than rather than a very high dimensional thing with tons of weights. Um, now the neural revolution uh, allows one to operate directly on all of the pixels, directly on all of the samples and in, in the sound, and uh, and and thereby eliminate the um, the the artificial dimensionality reduction that comes from uh, engineers. Uh, you know, just kind of uh, coding up, um, uh, coding up the features themselves, and uh, one of the one of the things that that started to enable is uh, the ability to run these networks in reverse, and and that's that's uh, sort of where Deep Dream came from. Uh, when Alex Morvinsev, who uh, is is in our team at, at Google uh, nowadays, uh, when he came up with with Deep Dream, uh, the the original intent was actually to make something that was sort of like a, a neuroscience technique. For deep networks that would allow one to uh, stimulate uh, a neuron high up in the network and see what kind of stimuli uh, actually uh, create that 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 activation. So you know the idea was to optimize in image space in order to maximize the activation of a neuron somewhere high up in, in the neural network. Uh, and uh, and Deep Dream was was really just the realization of that idea where the starting point of the optimization is an existing image, and um, and one sort of increases, one cranks up the contrast or, or, or the, the activation of a certain neuron and see like what, what is that thing responding to. So what started as a, as a, a kind of a neuroscience of artificial neurons technique, uh, it turned into, uh, into a, trippy, a trippy art project. And, and this was part of the genesis of our artists and machine intelligence program. And you know, we, we, we've had a number of artists explore these techniques and related things and, and uh, for, for artistic ends. And, and the, the results have been pretty cool and a lot, in some cases, a lot less kitsch than, than the initial uh, uh, trippy squirrel work. These were some other sorts of category visualization exercises that happened in the early days of, of this uh, transformation. Um, so, uh, you know, if you start with white noise and you uh, and you maximize the activation of a heart beast neuron, uh, then, you know, you get some kind of 
some kind of impressionistic rendering of heart beasts or, or of measuring cups or of ants or of starfish. Uh, there's one of these that, that, is, uh, that is about uh, dumbbells. And because the corpus of images that were used to train uh, all of these things included dumbbells in natural settings, the dumbbell one actually has an arm attached to it, which is, is sort, of, sort of fun. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, there, there are a few things quote unquote wrong with these, uh, with these visualizations. And, and a lot of why they look like they do is because the convolutional nets that, uh, that, were, that were used to, uh, to make these visualizations are designed to be invariant to lighting and pose and, uh, and certainly to, to position. They're translationally invariant by definition. And, uh, and so when you, when you do this uh, optimization in image space, you get sort of superpositions of, of, of different translations, and in some cases also superpositions of other kinds of poses, uh, other kinds of invariants that the network has learned. And, uh, and that's, that's what gives you this, this sort of um, uh, cubist and, and psychedelic quality. Um, back in 2014, I, I believe, um, uh, or, or earlier, uh, Alex Graves uh, was experimenting with recurrent neural nets uh, to do uh, things like handwriting synthesis. And this, in, in my view, is one of the first moments when we had a, a purely neural model without, uh, without any features coded in that, that was generating something uh, quote unquote convincing, meaning going from, uh, from meaning to media as opposed to from media to meaning uh, in, a, in a way that, um, that looked like it could have, been, uh, could have come from, from real life. And uh, the, the, reason, the reason that this was one of the first ones is because the, uh, the parametric space that it's operating in is relatively low dimensional. It's not, it's not synthesizing an image, it's synthesizing a trajectory of, of, of a pen. But um, uh, it was interesting. And you know, this, this uh, demo, I, I, I tried it on the, on, online the other day and it, doesn't, it, it looks like it's not, it's not uh, working at this point, but, uh, but it was a pretty cool demo and it allows you to you know, type out a string and then have the network synthesize that string as if it were handwritten in all sorts of different styles and um, you know in principle such a thing can uh, could could learn or could infer your style from uh, you know just a handful of examples and um, and then and then synthesize anything in that style and um, uh, and it's convincing uh, it looks it looks pretty good uh, this is certainly the end of um, it's the end of the idea that a signature uh, could possibly be a biometric uh, if if that if that was ever a thing. And um, Alex and collaborators at, at, uh, at DeepMind, uh, not too long after that, started to work with, um, with sound and, uh, and, and WaveNet is in some sense the, the generalization of the same sorts of techniques to, uh, to auditory synthesis. Uh, if you go to the, to the WaveNet page, you can find um, examples of, um, of the same exact recurrent network synthesizing uh, speech in a way that sounds much more convincing than the concatenative techniques or the parametric techniques that, uh, that, had, that had come before and that use uh, feature reduction. And, um, and the same network can learn to synthesize piano music or, or arbitrary other sorts of sounds, a very, very general uh, technique because, because there are no features being coded here. Now, uh, around the same time that that was happening, um, we we were playing with um, with ways of doing of doing neural synthesis, uh, you know, and going from from sort of trippy images to slightly less trippy or slightly more controlled images. And uh, so, this is an example of FaceNet being used to uh, to do deep dream on the left on a cloud image, and on on the right, um, Alex, uh, the um, the inventor of deep dream, is driving the embedding of my face. In FaceNet with his face, so you know here, you know these were some early experiments at trying to constrain all of the invariances of the synthesis using a model, um, and you can see that it, you know it's it's starting to work. It's starting to give you something that's a little bit more coherent as an image, but uh, but it's certainly not uh, it's certainly not the sort of thing that you know you look at and you think um, oh, well that could have been taken with a camera, um, and uh, you can see it at moments, especially when his face is in certain poses, the um, uh, you know, my, my face is in, is in a, a much more obvious sort of superposition of states. Uh, and, and if you look closely, you can see, you know, ear, ears and, and noses and mouths popping up all over the place where they don't belong. Uh, then there was uh, WarpNet. So 
this is um, this was a, an, an attempt to uh, uh, to simplify the problem uh, without going all the way to um, uh, to to feature coding. Uh, so the idea was to take an image and uh, and and redirect where the eyes are looking uh, with a combination of a displacement field on on the image and um, and some modifications to to uh, pixel intensity and. Uh, and this was this was a model that was that was actually trained um, to be convincing in the sense that uh, you know you could sort of you had workers clicking on which which image of of two they think is the is the fake one, and these models are optimized to um, uh, to have that human judge that that human critic um, uh, not know. Uh, which which one is which one is real and which one is fake? So these animations are uh, are from uh, from images uh, that already existed. Um, there is um, you know minimal manual intervention here. I, I think I, I'm 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 not remembering now whether the eyes are found automatically by uh, by their technique or not. But finding eyes is of course trivial. We have lots of techniques for doing that, and uh, and then the redirection of the eyes is fully automatic and and is quite convincing. Um, but this isn't exactly de novo synthesis, of course. Uh, also, uh, Ulanov's uh, deep image prior, which is uh, you know more more recent work, allows um, for uh, for in painting to happen in a very convincing way. So here you can you can remove pieces of an image, and uh, and and this this technique will use priors uh, that come from unsupervised learning of very large corpora of images to uh, hallucinate in what belongs uh, what belongs in the uh, uh, in in the in the corrupted parts. Um, and uh, and it's really good. Like these 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 results, um, I, I really found quite stunning when when I saw them for the first time. Um, and uh, in in a, in a sense, what is going on here is something very similar to uh, to what uh, Stalin's censors did with airbrushes when uh, they were you know airbrushing Trotsky out of uh, out of a photo or or something. Um, you know you you uh, you razor out or you spray paint out. Um, uh, uh, you know, a part of a a part of an image, and then you have to be an artist, and you have to kind of uh, imagine what um, what goes in uh, what goes in the hole, and um, uh, and so you know now we start to get into techniques that you know while they while they still operate with existing images, uh, are modifying them in ways that are designed to make the original image look like something that it's not, uh, and uh, and you know give you give you sort of powerful automated tools for doing that uh, in in a very short time. Where um, where the kind of uh, you know Stalin era airbrush artists you know might take uh, a day or, or a week uh, to to do that sort of that sort of detailed work. Now, um, the the advent of generative adversarial networks I think is a, a pretty important watershed moment, and 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 this this happens in um, uh, about 2014 or so. So all of this is very recent history, of course, and. What what GANs do is uh, they pit two networks against each other. There's a, um, an artist and a critic. Um, the job of the critic is to emit one bit that says, uh, you know, do we does does the network believe that this uh, is real or fake? And the job of the artist is to fool the critic, uh, and, um, uh, and and to have the critic perform as close to chance as possible. And and the, the the fun idea here is that one can train both of those systems up together. So a little bit like AlphaGo Zero, in which one uh, one trains uh, you know a Go playing uh, neural net through uh, through self play. Uh, here you have uh, two networks training each other uh, through through self play. It's hard. It's tricky to get right because you you have essentially created a dynamical system. Uh, in which uh, the you know you have you have sort of a mutual pursuit of of two different agents, and there are all kinds of, of of bad behavior that can emerge, lack of convergence or cycles or, or chaos. So it's you know it's a it's, a, it's an interesting sort of um, uh, attractor and and dynamics uh, kind of problem. But if you get it right, uh, then you can get these two things really kind of laddering laddering up and up and up. And uh, the the job of the critic is. Exactly the kind of thing that that deep nets do really well. Um, you know, if you if you make a hot dog detector or um, a bicycle detector, you know that the reason that these things work so much better than they used to is because it's very hard to um, to write a sort of feature engineered code that will that will really give you the uh, you know sort of what is a what is a bike uh, 
kind of kind of thing. You know, if, if if you make wheel detectors and handlebar detectors and so on, and then you try and make some logic about that, well, you know, bikes have to have two wheels. Well, what about training wheels? That breaks it. Uh, okay, well, that's no good. Um, what about uh, you, you know, it, it can't have a motor because it's, 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 it has a motor. It's a motorcycle. But what about an electric bike? No, that's a bike. You know, so so. Um, those those kinds of those kinds of implicit categories that are not very well posed are exactly the kinds of things that, that deep neural nets do a wonderful job of, and telling whether something looks real or not real is is the kind of task that there's no way one could do a sort of feature engineered approach uh, to and, and and have and, and have work out in a convincing way. Uh, you you need uh, just lots of examples, and you need the network to learn implicitly what what looks realistic, and and any new way of making something unrealistic has to be recognized immediately. Now, I think that there was a real watershed moment in in Gans uh, in Nvidia's work from uh, uh, from October of 2017. So this is uh, just about a year ago, uh, as I give this talk, a little less than a year ago. Um, the uh, this this uh, machine learning team at, at Nvidia. Um, made uh, some some generalizations to uh, the GAN approach, some tweaks uh, that allowed it to train um, uh, on, um, on on very fast hardware and in a multi-scale approach. So you start by synthesizing coarsely and then more finely. And um, uh, the, the original GAN, of course, uh, did something like that as well. But um, but this was um, this was done on on heavier hardware and, and with some optimizations and and here the uh, what we see are the results of of that sort of of GAN trained on the celeb A data set. So these are uh, lots of pictures of celebrities, and um, and you can see that that what gets synthesized uh, looks um, absolutely uh, convincing. Uh, I I hesitate to say real because I'm not sure that celebrity photos. Even in their original form, are particularly real, but uh, but they they don't they don't look very discriminable from um, from the photos that you might see on on magazines in the checkout counter. So this is really a, a pretty special moment, in, in my opinion. And uh, the technique is completely general. Uh, you know, if you if you apply it to pictures of, of cathedrals or of bridges uh, or of cars, you get these kind of continual and rather convincing syntheses of those kinds of objects. I think the face one is probably the most dramatic because that's the, the case where um, you know, a, large, a large data set can really sample the space. Uh, in, in, you know, and, and in these other cases, the spaces may be a, a little bit higher dimensional and, and one would need even, even more data uh, or a bigger network or longer training times to get it. Um, the, uh, the, the picture that I'm showing you over here is, is, um, is a meme uh, synthesized at the bottom of a cat picture. So if you look for cat pictures on the internet, of course, you'll find a lot of, of meme ones. And there's not enough training data in the cat set for uh, for this network to learn English uh, or, or to learn, um, uh, or even to learn writing, to learn the alphabet. Although you can see that it does do something alphabet-ish. And, and you know, the, the font is kind of right, even if the letters are not quite right. Um, and, and so that gives you a little bit of a sense of what has been learned. Um, now, why does this matter? Well, um, we we are um, we are in an era that uh, that some some people have called uh, post truth. Um, I, I think that that the the Trump dossier kind of uh, epitomizes uh, uh, you know some of the some of the issues that we're currently confronting. Um, the idea that there might be uh, this uh, this tape, this compromising tape out there, um, which uh, you know, at various points, um, the president has said, is, you know, uh, doesn't exist or is fake, uh, you know, or, or the, the things that were said were not said is, um, you know, this, this is the sort of thing that when, when, uh, when say the Billy Bush uh, uh, video and, and audio recording of, of the president came out uh, a couple of years ago and, um, and he denied it and said that, th that this was synthetic and fake, that was not a convincing argument. Uh, back in in 2016, if that were to happen uh, today, it would be uh, entirely plausible because the kinds of techniques that we've been talking about uh, can easily synthesize uh, that that sort of media uh, from uh, from meaning. Uh, and and just as a sort of illustration of that, uh, 2016's Rogue One, uh, you know, involved this famous scene in in which uh, Carrie Fisher is is uh, is, is reanimated. Uh, in in her, you know, as her as her youthful uh, Princess Leia 
self. And this was a really hard task in 2016. Uh, Director Gareth Edwards was hesitant. It's a really difficult task and we haven't got a plan B. Thankfully, after many, many takes, they got this scene right. But for this one scene, a whole lot of work went into it. Um, so this was, um, this was a massive undertaking. It was a Hollywood scale production. It was just a few seconds of, of video uh, and it was risky. Uh, and it was done uh, entirely with feature engineering and, and, and heavyweight sorts of approaches, right? So uh, lots of fiducial points projected onto the face of the actress who, uh, who played uh, Carrie Fisher and, uh, you know, and, and lots of sort of feature engineering techniques for, for grafting the one face onto the other. Uh, today, uh, there is an app for that. So, you know, fake app um, uh, or, or deep, deep fakes allow one to do this um, with um, minimal supervision. Um, uh, Benjamin Walker, uh, the, uh, the, the podcaster in theory of everything, uh, sort of uh, snarkily imagined uh, a bot that would uh, that would do um, uh, that would do a sort of deep fakes uh, social attack on a person automatically in response to tweets, uh, and that's the sort of thing that is now possible. Not only not only to reduce the amount of labor needed to do this kind of thing uh, to something that can be done in a very short time, but to but to make th make that labor so minimal that it can be fully automated and put into a, into a feedback loop. Um, now, we also are in the era that uh, John Ronson has uh, written about very compellingly in, in, in his book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, in which uh, people can be destroyed um, in, uh, in a very, very short period of time. Uh, you know, one, one of the stories that, that uh, John tells in this, in this book is, is about um, somebody who uh, made an, an ill-advised uh, tweet uh, while taking off in an airplane uh, turned her phone off, and by the time she had uh, she had landed where she was going, uh, she had uh, you know turned on her phone again. She had uh, lost her job, and uh, and been vilified on, on the internet. And and this is this is uh, the flip side of the kind of of the kind of accountability that we've been seeing with the with the Me Too movement, of course. Um, but uh, if you combine that with the ability to synthesize media on command uh, and even in an automatic manner using bots, uh, you end up with with uh, with something pretty alarming. So, uh, you know, the, the thesis that, that, uh, that I think we need to all kind of come to grips with is that convincing media synthesis technology, if you combine it with, uh, with, with large systems, uh, and especially with centralized surveillance and control over the internet, is an incredibly empowering technique for authoritarian regimes. Uh, and uh, you know this is this is um, the sort of mass use of those kinds of techniques in much the same way that Stalin's censors uh, used it in, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, while simultaneously those kinds of techniques are extraordinarily corrosive to the foundations of freer and more democratic societies. Um, uh, you know, in a society that doesn't have uh, total surveillance, total control over its over its internet, but that is. Uh, that is open and that allows all sorts of actors to uh, create social graphs, to propagate media, um, and uh, and to and to customize, to essentially generate those uh, those media in, in ways that they'll propagate among among subpopulations or even tailor them to individuals. Um, one can really uh, create create a scenario in which uh, everybody's reality uh, uh, really is a kind of uh, simulation, an arbitrary simulation, uh, and it's difficult to imagine. Um, how it is that one can uh, one can run a democracy uh, in a situation where not only is everybody's reality uh, fragmented uh, and polarized, as uh, as Eli Pariser has talked about with filter bubbles, but where those bubbles themselves are are, are literally synthetic worlds.